Здравствуйте, welcome back to Russian Theory Propaganda. Today is day 12, and we have a topic today that on the one hand can be explained in a couple of minutes, but on the other may take months to really get comfortable with. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's our first really difficult Russian idiom. So we've mentioned this concept earlier that when we use the word idiom in this course, we'll mean uh, kind of a peculiar way uh, or seemingly peculiar way, a new language has of expressing a very basic idea. Uh, we saw that, for example, with the possession idiom, right, where we say in English, I have a book. We say in Russian, a book is at me, if we translate it sort of literally, right? У меня есть книга. And the reason that's tricky is that, uh, first of all, we're talking about that kind of thing all the time, right? So it's really important to, to know it in the first place. But whenever we go to express this idea of possession, our brain is kind of defaulting to the English uh, idiom of I have X, right? Which, in, in which case the X would be a direct object, right? The object of the verb I have. Whereas in Russian, uh, the thing we possess is the subject of the sentence, right? A, a book is at me or whatever, right? So it's a completely unusual uh, um, construction at first. So uh, today's is uh, a bit trickier, right? At, at least we can think of the possession idiom, a book is at me. We can think of that literally, and it makes perfect sense in English. It just sounds odd. But the uh, idiom we're learning today is, I think, a lot more confusing. So it's one of those ways in which Russian sometimes forces us to uh, really think about the world in a, in a completely new and unaccustomed way. So the idiom today is that of non-existence. So before we get to that, let's first review what we know about how to say something exists. We've really covered all of this grammar already in chapter one, right? To talk about existence, we use the nominative case, right? The case we were using in, in book one, in chapter one, plus the verb yest, right? Which means is, right? As we know that that form yest is the only remaining form in modern Russian in the present tense of the verb to be, right? So anything could be the subject of the verb yest. And we also learned that we only use that verb if it's being emphasized for some reason, right? Normally we would drop the yest, right? We would drop the linking verb in Russian in sentences like on student, right? On student in English, he is a student. But in Russian, we drop the yest, we simply say on student. But if we're asking a question, uh, as to whether or not something is, right, then we would have to stress, we would have to emphasize the yeast and include it in the sentence, right? У тебя есть книга? У тебя есть книга? Right, the point of that question is the is, right? Is there a book at you or is there not, right? That is, do you have a book or do you not have a book? So let's review some simple examples. Uh, for example, look at this question. Есть машина? Есть машина? Is there a car? Da yeast, machine yeast. Okay, so in all those examples where we, we are using the yeast because that's really the point of the question and then in turn the answer to the question. <clears throat> so if we say machine yeast, we're emphasizing the fact that the car exists, right? There is a car. Now we can throw in an u construction to uh, add in the idea of possession. <clears throat> so for example, Utibia yeast machine, right? Is there a car at you? Do you have a car? And one response to that, да, у меня есть машина. У меня есть машина. Okay, so what case have we been using in all of these examples for the noun machina? We've been using the nominative, right? Because it's the subject of the verb есть, right? So machina, machina, all across the board, we're getting the nominative of this uh, feminine noun. So that uh, allows us to kind of formulate the idiom, the Russian idiom for expressing existence is very similar to the English one, right? We say something is, right? Uh, if we look that over across the three tenses, uh, just to review, right, we could ask these questions. Что у тебя есть? Or, for example, uh, in the past tense, что у тебя было? In future tense, что у тебя будет? Right now, in those questions, the subject is что, right, which is treated as a neuter, right? So that explains why the Past tense form of the verb is буила, буила. Что у тебя есть? Now, if we include the есть in that first question, right, it means we're asking, you know, what what is at you? What do you have generally? Whereas if we said simply что у тебя, 
it may mean we're looking at something, we see that the person has something, we're asking, hey, what's that there? What's, what, what do you have there? That type of question. Right, so in the present tense, the yeast uh, could conceivably be dropped based on the context, but in the past and future, remember, we can't drop the, the linking verb. We have to include, uh, you know, builla, budget, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, now let's see answers to that question. And again, we've got examples of all with all three genders. Uh, you'll see why that's so important in a moment. Um, now, again, in the present tense, based on context, we could drop the yeast, right? What if we were simply saying, I have the book, right? So, again, the existence of the book isn't in question, right? It's, uh, we're just simply saying that it's it's at us, right? We could say, the book is at me, I have the book. Right, so uh, again, that's a bit tricky, but uh, the the point here ultimately is that the yeast can always be dropped in the present tense if it's not being emphasized. But again, we go to the past tense, we have to include the linking verb, and as we know, uh, it agrees with the subject, so it's going to change form, right? Umenya bil stol, umenya bila kniga, umenya bila akno. Right, what are the subjects of those sentences? Stol, kniga, Aknor, right? The table was at me. Book was at me. Window was at me, right? Those are the subjects. So the verb will is changing to agree with the subject in the past tense. Will, bila, bila. Okay, in the future tense, uh, we're saying budget. Uh, and here, that's not, that's not changing either because we're only using singular nouns for now, remember? Uh, we're going to add plural nouns in book two, right? So... Um, we say, umenya budget stol, umenya budget kniga, umenya budget aknor, right? For example, um, the table will be at me. I will have a table. Uh, now, we know that the uh, future tense forms are not marked for gender, right? Uh, so again, that's why we're using budget across the board here. Now, if we move on to uh, the idiom for non-existence, things get a lot more complicated. And let's look first at a poster and get a quick preview. Uh, this is kind of a slightly humorous one, right? This is uh, purely legendary as far as I can tell. But, uh, of course, everyone knows that, hopefully, that Yuri Gagarin was the first human being to orbit the Earth. And, of course, he was uh, from the Soviet Union. So this was a huge triumph for the Soviet space program. Um, anyway... And he was reputed to have said, although it seems to be just a kind of urban legend or whatever, that, uh, you know, he got up into the uh, into outer space and he looked around and he saw no God in the, in the heavens or whatever. And he said, Boganyed, right, kind of humorously confirming that, yep, there's no God up here. There's no heaven. OK, so look at what he says. Boganyed. We've seen the noun Borg already in, in uh, I think, back in day, on day three or whatever. Borg means God, and it's a masculine noun. Okay, now we see the word niet. That means no. We, we've seen that already. Uh, so what case is Borg in? Uh, well, it's in the genitive, right? The case we just learned yesterday. We've added an a ah to the masculine noun Borg, and we've gotten Borga. Borga niet. And uh, so that means there is no God, and that gives us uh, essentially our Russian idiom for expressing non-existence. Nyet plus the genitive. Nyet plus the genitive case, that's simply how you express the idea of something not existing. Uh, now, again, it's really, I think, ultimately impossible to think of that literally in English. It would be something like, there is not of something. You get this idea of an of. An of uh, we'll talk more about that later, that the genitive case generally can be used to express quantity. We're going to talk about that in, in a later chapter, um, right? And in this case, not only quantity, but the complete lack of any quantity, right? There, there is nothing of something whatsoever. It doesn't exist. That's maybe one way to think literally of the meaning of this idiom. Now, uh, what would a uh, maybe a priest or some... A uh, religious person respond to this statement, Borganiet. They would say, Borgiest, right? God is, meaning God exists. That's the existence con construction that might be used to oppose the non existence, Borganiet. 
Yeah, of course, um, uh, as a good communist, we could maybe say that uh, uh, religia opium la naroda, right? Religia opium la naroda. Religion is the opium of the, I think in English we say the masses, don't we usually? Anyway, in Russian, opium la naroda, opium for the people. Religion is opium for the people. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look now at uh, a table uh, with examples, again, in all three tenses and for all three genders and see how this Russian idiom for non-existence plays out. But first, we have to note the most remarkable thing about this idiom, and this is what is so confusing for English speakers. This is our first example of a subjectless construction in Russian. Okay, what does that mean, subjectless? Well, it means there's no subject. There's no subject in the construction. Okay, what does that mean in terms of Russian grammar? Well, to have a subject in Russian, you have to have the nominative case, right? We know already that that's the case used for subjects. We were using that all throughout uh, chapter one, right? So in essence, if we see a Russian phrase, a Russian construction, and there's no word there in the nominative case, then we can be certain that there's no grammatical subject and that we're dealing with a subjectless construction. Okay, so if we think back to the phrase Bolganyad, right, there is no nominative case noun there. there, therefore there is no subject. It's a subjectless construction in which the noun Bolga is in the genitive. So what makes uh, these subjectless expressions so difficult for English speakers is that uh, English doesn't really tolerate uh, truly subjectless expressions. The closest English gets really are uh, things, uh, sentences with uh, so-called dummy subjects like it or there. So for example, uh, it is raining or um, there is no milk left, right? There's no milk. So it and there, right, can kind of play, kind of stand in for a subject. So they're sometimes referred to as dummy subjects. Uh, but still, if we think of the sentence, it is raining, right? We really can think of it as uh, filling the role of a subject because English really insists on having a subject almost always. We'll see later that this is by no means the only subjectless construction in Russian, right? The non-existence expression is one of many um, subjectless uh, expressions. We're, we'll learn more later in this book, and then eventually we'll also learn some subjectless verbs that are never used with a uh, a noun in the nominative, right? That That is, they're never used with a subject. Okay, so let's look at this table. Again, compare it to the one we started today's lesson with, and we're getting now the non-existence expression uh, and seeing how it plays out across the three tenses and across the three genders. Okay, let's start in the present. Okay, what's the formula for expressing non-existence? Nyet plus the genitive. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, that's, that's today's lesson in, in, in a nutshell. Okay, so if we want to say there's no table, there's no book, there's no window, we just need niet plus the genitive case of those nouns, right? Niet stala, niet knigi, niet akna, right? These things don't exist. There is no table, there is no book, there is no window. <clears throat> now in the past tense, we have to think for a moment, what form of will will we need? Well, again, think back to the first table. We had buil, buila, buila, right? Because we had subjects and the form of the verb was changing to agree with the subject. Now in this new idiom, we have no subject. And that brings us to one more important point we should make about any subjectless expression in Russian. Any verb form that appears in a subjectless expression is going to look like a neuter singular verb form, right? So. Indeed, in the past tense here, we get nebula, nebula, note the stress is on the nye there, nebula, plus the genitive, right? So again, we're getting this genitive to express non-existence. The only thing changing is the, the right, instead of niet, we're saying nebula. So for example, nebula stala, nebula knigi, nebula akna. Again, note how it's buila, 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 right? With the oa, there's no change uh, because again, we don't have subjects. Table, book, window are not the subjects of these sentences, right? So we can't really emphasize that enough here. Nebula stala, nebula knigi, nebula akna. Finally, what about future? Well, again, subjectless expression, we're going to get the form of the verb that would agree with neuter singular. That would be, of course, budget, budget, right? That's third singular. 
that would work for any gender, including neuter singular. So the formula is nebujit, uh, sorry, nebujit plus genitive. Nebujit stala, nebujit knigi, nebujit akna. Okay, let's practice uh, running through this pattern here, both the possession and non-possession or existence and non-existence. <clears throat> and sort of like we were doing earlier, right, we could toss in an ooh expression, combine that with a non-existence, right, with the niet plus the genitive to say not simply that something is not, but that we don't have it, right? We don't have it. Something is not at me. All right, so let's start with, look at 12a, and let's say we have a puppy, right? Uh, so first in the in the present, I have a puppy. Umunya yest shinlok. Umunya yest shinlok. Okay, I had a puppy. Past tense. We need to change the verb. Umunya bil shinlok. Umunya bil shinlok. I will have a puppy. Uh, right again, a puppy will be at me. Umunya budjet shinlok. Umunya budjet shinlok. Okay, now let's say we don't have a puppy. Okay, we've got to think very carefully. We, we really shouldn't think about English at all, right? Because if we try to translate from English, we're going to get very confused. Uh, so in the present tense, our formula is niet plus the genitive. Umenya niet shinka. Remember, shinok was one of those mobile vowel masculine nouns, right? So the o is going to get squeezed out, and we're going to get the genitive form shinka. Shinka, umenya niet shinka. Literally, there is no puppy at me. I have no puppy. Okay, uh, past tense, I didn't have a puppy. Umenya niebola shinka. Right, keep the genitive, shinka. We just need to change the verb, make it past tense. Niebola is the proper form. I won't have a puppy. Okay, future tense, umenya niebujit shinka. Same thing, keeping the genitive, shinka, just changing the verb to future tense. Okay, uh, let's take koshka, now a feminine example. I have a cat. Umunya yest koshka, right? A cat is at me. Umunya yest koshka. I had a cat. Umunya bula koshka, right? Literally, a cat was at me. I will have a cat. A cat will be at me. Umunya bujit koshka. Umunya bujit koshka. Now, I don't have it. Uh, we're switching to niet plus the genitive. Umunya niet koshki. Right, genitive of koshka is koshki. Remember the seven-letter spelling rule tells us we can't write an u. Instead, we write e. Umunya niet koshki. Uh, past tense. Umunya niebula koshki. Right, just changing the verb. In future, just changing the verb again. Umunya niebudjet koshki. Okay, what about muila? Muila is neuter, of course, right? Uh, I have soap. Umunya yest muila. Umunya yest muila. I had soap. Umunya buila muila. Umunya buila muila. Right, I will have soap. Soap will be at me, literally. Umunya bujit muila. Okay, past tense, I don't have it. We're going to go from muila to muila. And I note you can't hear the difference because of the vowel reduction, right? But we, we need the genitive. So muila becomes muila, muila. Umunya niet muila. Umunya niet muila. Okay, past tense, umunya niebula muila, right? Niebula. Muila, we're keeping the genitive. And future tense, umunya niebujit muila. A nice little paslovit senanyet i sudanyet. That's a fairly common one and a, 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 really, a really useful one, right? It means literally, onto nyet, there's no judgment. Uh, just trying to translate it literally it doesn't sound very nice. It basically means there's no judging a no, right? There's no judging a no, meaning if someone says no, it's no. no a no means no, and there's nothing really you can say about, about it or uh, object. To. Let's look at a few phrases that are really useful just for being polite, and they all involve the uh, genitive case. Um, for reasons we'll revisit later, but essentially there's a verb that's left understood. Uh, that verb is gelat, and it means to wish something, right? So uh, we sort of mentioned, I think, briefly that certain verbs 
will require a certain case, right? They'll take an object in some case other than the accusative that you might normally expect for direct objects. More on that later, of course. So anyway, the verb gelat is followed by the genitive case. So I wish you something. I wish you uh, a pleasant appetite, literally. The thing we're wishing is going into the genitive. Now, we don't really have to learn this verb right now. We're going to start learning verbs tomorrow because all we need to know is that the verb itself is normally understood. It's not stated. But because it requires a genitive, then you get all these um, kind of polite wishes in Russian that are simply uh, phrases in the genitive case. Because, again, the idea is I wish you something. The something is appearing in the genitive. So, for example, um, uh, bon appetit is... Uh, Priatnova appetita, literally pleasant appetite. I wish you a pleasant appetite. So we're getting priatni appetit in the appearing here in the genitive. Priatnova appetita. Bon voyage is literally happy path, happy journey. Again in the genitive. Shislivova puti. Shislivova puti. That word puti is a bit peculiar, so don't don't let the form here confuse you. We'll talk about it more. Uh, I think in book two. Shisleva of a puti. Bon voyage. Okay, literally good relaxation. We can say this to mean like have a ha have a nice vacation, have have a happy time off. Literally good relaxation. Kharoshiva oddicha. Kharoshiva oddicha. Right? That meaning uh, I wish you a good oddich, a good uh, relaxation. Okay, um, Nice weekend. This is actually a genitive plural right now. Remember, we're not really learning plural forms right now. I just threw this one in because it's so common, and students always want to know how to say this. So let's just learn it for now as a as a set phrase. <laughs> is a day off. So we're literally saying something like, "Good days off." Right? Good. Have a good weekend. Have a nice weekend. Good chance to practice your ch there. Okay, a few more phrases in the genitive, right? Udachi. You're wishing someone udacha, right? And again, just putting it into the genitive. Udachi, udachi, good luck. Uh, good night. Spakoini noichi. Now, again, this phrase, um, the, the noun noich is a bit funny. We're going to learn more about it in book, book two. So for now, let's just learn this phrase. Spakoini Noichi, good night. And finally, this is a good way to uh, end letters, by the way. If you're writing a letter in Russia, you can say all the best, right? Meaning best wishes or whatever. Sivo dobrova. Literally all, yeah, literally all the best. All, or all the, all the good, all the good, actually. Sivo dobrova. Okay, let's do a few exercises here and uh, just being very careful to follow the Russian idiom, right? Resist every uh, every instinct we have. Uh, again, the best tip here is really just try not to think of the English at all. It's really not helpful at all. I mean, that's generally true, of course, when you're learning a language, but especially with some of these idioms that just almost literally, literally cannot be translated even even word for word into English. Uh, so we've got to just completely jettison every expectation we have based on English grammar. Okay, let's take these uh, statements of existence, which are in the present tense, and simply put them into the past and the future. So now we're working with the existence idiom, right? So this should be relatively easy. Uh, now, premier, right? For example, у меня есть новая машина. I have a new car. Okay, let's say we could say раньше, right? Meaning previously, I had a new car. Right, just make that past tense. У меня была новая машина. And we could say, скоро, soon I'll have a new car. У меня будет новая машина. Okay, so this is pretty easy, I hope. Number one, у меня есть новый ключ. I have a new key. So how would that be in past tense? Sorry, у него, у него, he, had, he has a new key. У него есть новый ключ. How would we say, he had a new key? A new key was at him. У него был. У него был новый ключ. Okay, he will have a new key. У него будет новый ключ. 
Okay, number two, у нее есть новая кошка. She has a new cat. Okay, let's make that past tense. Our subject is кошка. So we'll say, у нее была новая кошка. Была. And uh, she will have a new cat. У нее будет новая кошка. У нее будет новая кошка. Number three, у них есть чистое белье. They have clean laundry. Okay, a, a, a neuter. У них было, было, right? Было, было чистое белье. They will have clean laundry. У них будет чистое белье. Number four, странная идея, right? A, a feminine, a soft feminine, by the way. Идея, right? You see it's a soft feminine. У вас есть странная идея. You people or you being polite, right? Uh, you have a strange idea. Let's say you had a strange idea or as I sometimes say, y'all had a strange idea. У вас была странная идея. Была, feminine. Uh, you will have a strange idea. У вас будет странная идея. Number five, uh, словар, that is uh, masculine. У тебя есть словар, you have a dictionary. Again, here we're using ты, we're being familiar with someone. У тебя был словар, you had a dictionary. Future tense, у тебя, у тебя будет словар, you will have a dictionary. Six, we have a major problem, we have a big problem. Uh, у, у нас есть большая проблема. Okay, past tense, у нас... Была проблема. У нас была большая проблема. I ran out of real estate there to add большая. You may see that every once in a while in these textbooks. Uh, anyway. Okay, we will have a problem. У нас будет проблема. У нас будет большая проблема. Right, we'll have a big problem. Okay, now let's switch gears and do the same thing, but now with non-existence. Okay, so now we have to be really careful. We've got this new idiom. English is of no help whatsoever. Uh, and again, we've got to be using the genitive everywhere. We can't simply leave the word in the nominative, right? We have no subjects. Look at the examples, right? Na primer. U mnie nie ma szyny. U mnie nie było maszyny. U mnie nie będzie maszyny. I don't have a car. I didn't have a car. I won't have a car. Okay, let's take now. By the way, some of these you see, we've got to fill in the ending, so we've got to think carefully what what is the gender of the word we're looking at. We might even have to look at the uh, dictionary, right? If we don't remember the starting form of the word. Okay, look at the number one. Looks like kluch, right? Right, key, and that is indeed a, a masculine noun. Okay, so how would we say I don't have a new key? Sorry, he doesn't have a new key. У него нет нового ключа. Masculine. Okay, now let's think for a moment. We could kind of cheat and kind of skip ahead, uh, all that we're going to change now is the tense, right? So the genitive part of this, novova klucha, is not going to change. So we could go go ahead and fill in novova klucha, novova klucha, novova klucha in all three tenses. That's not going to change. But the verb will change, right? So let's do the past tense. He didn't have a new key. У него не было, не было новова ключа. Now, remember in the past tense, не было, we're going to always use that in these non-existence expressions. We don't have to worry about gender agreement or anything like that because there's no subject. So, у него не было нового ключа. He won't have a new key. У него не будет нового ключа. Не будет. Okay, number two, let's take the new cat. Okay, кошка is feminine, so we need a feminine genitive ending. У нее нет новой Koshki, right? Oi, e. Uh, she doesn't have a new cat. Okay, let's say she didn't have a new cat. Past tense. У нее не было, не было новой кошки. And future tense. У нее не будет новой кошки. Again, новой кошки. That genitive portion is not changing. Новой кошки, новой кошки, новой кошки. Number three. Uh, Okay, again, we're using чистое белье. That's a neuter, remember? And by the way, it's a soft neuter. So to say they don't have clean laundry, that'll be у них нет чистого 
bilya, chistava bilya. Right? Uh, again, note the softness, bilya, ya, 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 instead of a. Okay, they didn't have clean laundry. U nich nie bila chistava bilya. They won't have clean laundry. U nich nie bude chistava bilya. Okay, uh, stranaya idea. We need to put that now into the genitive, right? You don't have a strange idea. That'll be stranay idei. Okay, remember idea, soft feminine, so we can't use u, right? We need a soft version of that ending, namely the soft vowel e, right? Idei. Okay, let's say you uh, you didn't have a strange idea, past tense. U vas nebola stranay idei. You won't have a strange idea. Future. U vas ne budet stranay idei. Okay, five. Uh, you don't have a dictionary. U tibia niet. Okay, let's think slavar. Uh, soft masculine, so we need to add ya. Right? Now, by the way, because we're writing the ya, right, we don't need this the soft sign anymore, right? Uh, so we write u tibia niet slavaria. Slavaria. Uh, that Er, ya, right? The ya is showing us that that is a soft R, right? That we have a soft stem. So that's the proper spelling. Okay, you didn't have a dictionary. U tibia niebola slovaria. U tibia niebola slovaria. In future, u tibia niebudit slovaria. Number six, problema. Okay, that's a hard feminine. U nas niet problemy, right? We don't have a problem. U nas niet problemy. Uh, we didn't have a problem. U nas nie bolo problemy. And we will not have a problem. U nas nie budet problemy. Quick paslovitsa. Niet dima bez agnia. Just like the English, where there's smoke, there's fire. In Russian, there is not smoke without fire. By the way, that's a nice little example. Uh, even though some of the words are unfamiliar, we can completely understand the grammar of that little folk saying. Okay, dim means smoke. So niet dima means there is no smoke, right? There is no smoke. And then the second half of the saying is a prepositional phrase. Agoin, agoin means fire or flame. It has a mobile vowel, so we're going to make it genitive to use with bies, and that gives us agnia, right? Niet dima bies agnia. There's no Smoke without fire. Okay, when, uh, let's do 12D. Um, so let's just ask questions and then respond both positively and negatively. And we have to watch the tense, right? We need to match, of course, the tense of the question. Na primer, yes, machina. Da, machina yest. Right, that's the positive answer. Or if we say, no, I don't have a car, that would be niet, machina niet. Okay, another present tense, sorry, future tense question. Kluch budget, kluch budget, right? Will there be a key? Let's say, yeah, there will be a key. Da, kluch budget, right? Just simply repeating the question basically as a statement, right? Kluch budget. But if we, we're going to answer negatively, we have to change the grammar, right? Niet, klucha nie budget, nie budget klucha. Klucha nie budget. Okay, number two, televizor. Uh, televizor u vas bil, right? Did you have a television? Okay, if we answer positively, that's easy. Da, televizor bil, da, bil televizor. Right, but few, but negatively, right, no, we didn't have a television. Niet, televizor nie bila. Televizor nie bila. By the way, note how we're, uh, we know that we're talking about a television, the 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 new and interesting part of our answer is the fact that it wasn't, right? That we didn't have it. And so we're saving, it, it sounds a bit better to save that for the end of the sentence. We're going to talk a lot more about word order later. I, um, you know, I have to say honestly that um, in, in first year, especially first semester, I've noticed that students love to ask about word order. They just, almost every second question is something about word order. And in all honesty, I think it's a, it's it's not very productive to just uh, rack one's brain over word order at this stage of Russian, right? We're really mostly worried about grammar, right? 
And uh, of course, one part of that is that we know Russian word order is very flexible. So it's, it's really quite difficult to make serious mistakes with Russian word order. Right now, of course, it's important. And as we move through the grammar, we're going to talk a lot more about Russian word order and how it works. So uh, be patient and we will talk about this. And we'll point out certain things that we're moving along, but I would really urge you as you're learning not to just lose, lose it completely every time you see some word order in an answer or a sentence that may seem a bit odd uh, and, and you sort of get uh, anxious and think, oh my God, I don't understand the word order, right? Just, just let it go, just chill, we'll talk about it later, right? Again, just always remind yourself, Russian word order is very flexible. And so again, that helps explain why um, it, it really is just a matter of emphasis uh, within a given context, right? It's not like it's something that's completely right or wrong grammatically. Usually that's not uh, the case. Okay, anyway, let's go to number uh, three. Do they have soap? Okay, let's answer positively. Yes, they have soap. Da, muila yest. Muila unich yest. That's easy. Okay, let's say they don't have soap. Niet. Muila unich niet. Niet unich muila. Right, again, we can juggle that word order in several different ways. The main thing we're interested in right now is getting the grammar right, right? Muila unich niet. Number four, uh, did we have an assignment? Zadanya u nas buila. Da zadanya buila. Da buila zadanya. Buila u nas zadanya. Right? We can say any number of those things, right? Zadanya buila. But if we want to say there was no assignment, right, we're switching to the non existence idiom. Zadanya nebula. Right? Zadanya nebula. Zadanya u nas nebula. Number five, computer budget. Will there be a computer? Da, computer budget, budget computer, right? There'll be a computer. Or no, there won't be a computer. Computer ne budget. Computer ne budget. Number six, a shipka bula. Was there a mistake? Let's say yes, there was a mistake. Da, a shipka bula. Bula a shipka. Uh, now, by the way, speaking of uh, sort of word order, right? Uh, if this were a, a being answered just in everyday colloquial Russian, we'd say, we'd ask, Ashibka Bula, and the Russian would say, Bula, right? They wouldn't repeat the word Ashibka normally, right? Because it's just understood, right? So again, keep in mind as we're doing these exercises, sometimes we're giving kind of the full version of an answer just to underscore the grammar, right? But uh, in, in real spoken Russian, normally you would avoid repeating things needlessly. And we've seen several examples of that already, but just keep it in mind as we, as we push forward. Okay, so da, ashibka bula, bula ashibka. Okay, let's say there wasn't a mistake. Ashibki nebula, ashibki nebula. There was no mistake there with the genitive. Okay, let's uh, do one more, 12e. Naprimir, u tvoyevo brata net mashiny, pravda? Okay, we're saying, hey, your brother doesn't have a car, right? And we're, we answer, come on, what are you talking about? Shtotui, literally, what you? That's just an idiom, again, kind of meaning, what, come on, what are you talking about? Uh, it's a little bit harsh, by the way. Well, not, not necessarily. Well, of course, if we wanted to be polite, we would say, vui, right? Shtovui, shtovui, right? Come on, what are you talking about? Uh, okay, and let's say, no, he does have this, right? He does have a car, of course. Okay, let's keep, uh, let's do number one. Utvai sestry nie slovaria, pravda? Right, your sister doesn't have a dictionary. Truth, right, meaning right. She doesn't have a, a dictionary, right? Shtoti, right? Come on, what are you talking about? Slavar uniyo yest kanyashna. Okay, look what we're doing. We're going from nyet slavaria to slavar, right? We're going back to the nominative because she does have this thing, right? A dictionary is at her. Okay, and uh, we're also replacing sestra, right, the, uh, or actually sestri, the noun with a pronoun, right? So we're saying not that my sister has a dictionary, but that she has a dictionary. A dictionary is at her. Slavar u njo jest, konjeshna. Okay, number two. U tvoje vodca nje televizora, pravda? Your father doesn't have a television, right? Što ti? Televizor? 
у него есть, конечно. Right? Телевизор – back to the nominative – у него, у него. He has it. Телевизор – у него есть. Number three. У них нет ребенка, правда? They don't have a child, right? Что ты, right? What are you talking about? Ребенок у них есть, конечно. Okay, remember that ребенок has a mobile vowel, right? So we're, again, we're going from ребенка back into the nominative, uh, ребенок. Ребенок у них есть, конечно. Number four. У нас сегодня нет задания, правда? We don't have an assignment today, right? Что ты? Задание у нас есть. Задание у нас есть, конечно. Going back to the nominative, right? Задание. Number five. У профессора нет ручки, правда? The professor doesn't have a pen, right? Что ты? У... Uh, sorry. Ручка у него есть, конечно. Of course he has a pen, right? Of course a pen is at him. Ручка у него есть, конечно. Number six. У тебя нет ключа, правда? You don't have a key, right? Что ты? Ключ у меня есть, конечно. Right? I do have a key. Ключ у меня есть, конечно. Another little saying. Uh, креста на тебе нет. Now, we haven't learned на тебе, although it looks kind of familiar. That means on you. Right? So we'll learn that... Uh, I don't remember in which chapter. I think chapter three, probably. Krista uh, na tibia niet. So the important thing for, for us today is niet krista. A krest is a cross. And here that's, that's referring to a, um, a cross necklace that Orthodox uh, Christians, well, Rus in Russia at least, uh, wear a cross. Around their necks, right? So it this that that explains this phrase "Krista niet na tibia." Krista na tibia niet means there's no cross on you, meaning basically that you're acting like the devil, right? You're acting so crazy and so shamelessly that uh, literally there's no cross on you. You're not wearing a cross. Okay, so that's a fairly, uh, you know, a, it's not like you hear it every day, but you know, if you're reading literature or whatever, it may come up. Just an interesting example uh, of. Uh, non-existence with the genitive. Okay, we can, here's a quick um, conversational thing. So again, we won't go through this, but you could run through it with a partner, right? Ask people whether or not they have these things, right? For, for example, computer. Okay, and then they help, they'll have to answer, right? If they answer positively, they'll do it with the nominative, right? Да, есть. У меня есть новый компьютер. Or to answer negatively, they'd have to use the genitive. Нет, у меня нет нового компьютера. Now, you can try that in the past tense. Think maybe, think back to your childhood or whatever and ask questions. У тебя был новый компьютер? Да, был. У меня был новый компьютер. Or нет, у меня не было нового компьютера. Okay, what about future, the future tense? У тебя будет новый компьютер? Да, будет. У меня будет новый компьютер. Or... Negating, нет, у меня не будет, sorry, не будет нового компьютера. Um, now, by the way, what if someone asks you, do you have a new computer? And you want to say, no, not only do I not have a new computer, I don't have one at all. Then you could throw in this word вообще, вообще. Right, у тебя есть новый компьютер? Нет, у меня нет компьютера вообще. Now, this word вообще generally means something like universally or generally or whatsoever or at all and we, you may see it thrown around here but we're going to talk about it quite carefully in book three when we move on to advanced verbal aspect now what is verbal aspect we mentioned that i think in passing we're going to talk about that here in just a couple of days so uh be careful what you ask for uh anyway we'll talk about that soon but anyway, later later on, we will come back to this, this word, Bob Shea. It's going to be a really important one. Okay, let's look again at masculine nouns that take feminine endings. So we, we talked about this already a couple of days ago. Uh, let's just focus now on how this works in the genitive, right? Again, we've had a few of these words. Papa, mushina, dedushka, dyadya, kolega, zanuda, pyanitsa. And they all are masculine despite taking feminine endings. Now, some of these, like kalyaga, 
can refer to a female colleague, in which case it would be treated as a feminine noun uh, completely. Right. So more on that another day. Uh, for now, let's just focus on these referring to men, right, because that's what's so confusing. Um, now, of course, most of these could only refer to men, right? Kaliaga is the only exception. Okay, so what makes these weird? They're masculine, but they take feminine endings. Okay, so hard to get used to. Okay, let's just look at some examples. Moy djedushka, right? My grandfather. Now, look, again, djedushka itself takes feminine endings, but everything modifying it is masculine. That's why we don't say maya djedushka. We say moy djedushka because he's masculine. So we say things like moy djedushka bil omunya. Right now, note the verb bil, right? Moy and bil, those are both masculine forms. Now, what if we say he doesn't have a, let's just use it in the genitive to say my grandfather doesn't have a television. Uma yevo djedushki nyet televizora. Nashnovi Kalyaga, right, our new male colleague. Nashnovi Kalyaga Buil Unas, right, he was visiting us. Unashivanova Kalyagi Bula Problema, our new colleague had a problem. Right now again note the agreement Unashava Novava, right? Those adjectives are masculine genitive, but the noun itself, Kalyagi, is taking feminine endings. Those are the only endings it can take. Etet mushina, this man. Etet strani mushina bills dies, this strange man was here. Or possession, uetava stranava mushini yest idea. Right now, again, look at mushini showing that feminine genitive ending. Finally, nash dyadia, nash lubimi dyadia bil nas, our favorite uncle was visiting us. He was at us. У нашего любимого дяди есть новая жена. Our favorite uncle has a new wife. Now again, compare a truly feminine noun, моя мама. Моя мама была у меня сегодня. У моей мамы есть хорошая новая машина. Okay, uh, so let's just do a couple of examples here. Filling in genitive endings and being careful, right? The adjectives are going to show masculine endings, but the noun itself uh, can only be feminine. Uh, Tvoi papa. Okay, does your dad have a car? U tvoivo papu yist mashina. Okay, tvoya mama, your mom. U tvoyei mamu yist mashina. Okay, that noun itself is feminine, right? So everything here is feminine. Tvoya mama, right? Okay, your grandfather. Tvoy djedushka. Does your grandfather have a dog? U tvoyevo djedushki yest sabaka. Okay, so tvoyevo, that's masculine, because djedushka is masculine, but it shows feminine endings, so djedushki in the genitive. Tvoya babushka. Okay, that's feminine completely, right? Your grandmother. Does your grandmother have a cat? U tvoyei babushki yest koshka. My grandmother had a cat named Snowball. Okay, so I would say, da, umaye babushki bila koshka. Tvoy your uncle. Does your uncle have a yacht? Utvoy vodjadji, yest yachta. Utvoy vodjadji, yest yachta. Okay, tvoya tjotje, your aunt. Okay, that's completely feminine across the board, of course. Does your aunt have a motorcycle? Okay, uh, so a few more questions you might practice answering, right, about your favorite things. Do you have a favorite TV show? Which, which one, namely, right? У тебя есть любимый фильм? Какой? Do you have a favorite movie? Uh, what kind of movie? Or in this case, we're really asking, you know, what what movie are you, is your favorite movie? So that's it for today's grammar. I thought before we uh, part for today that uh, I'd pull a book off the shelf. I may do this from time to time and just toss out some uh, recommendations for uh, Russian books. And of course, not all of these are Russian, but... Uh, I'll try to find something relevant. 
uh, to our discussion anyway, I thought I'd uh, today recommend a book by uh, Vasily Grossman called Zizni Sudba, Zizni Sudba. So if you think about the big Russian novels, you can tell this is the big one. Uh, maybe the first one that comes to mind is Vaina i Mir, right, War and Peace, uh, which is this epic that goes back and forth, well, set during the wars against Napoleon, right, but it's setting, uh, shifting back and forth from the battlefield to uh, sort of domestic life, life back in, in Russia during the war. So it's a very similar dynamic here. Um, uh, this book, Zizni uh, Sujba, is uh, actually the second in a series on, on World War II, and this one focuses on the Battle of Stalingrad. But again, there are lots of other things that it covers. Uh, um, Vasily Grossman was uh, a correspondent, uh, a reporter who spent, uh, I think it's around three years, a, a good deal of time uh, on the front, so he saw all of this firsthand and then wrote about it. Uh, this book is somewhat notorious for the fact that it, it was, you know, one of many works that wasn't published. And in fact, the uh, the manuscript was confiscated. I think the uh, they they say even the the ribbon of the of the typewriter on which it was written was confiscated. It was considered that sensitive, and Grossman was told that he could not publish it. And, it, and indeed, it could not be published in the Soviet Union for at least two hundred years because it was so threatening. And the basic reason for that was that. Uh, Throughout this novel, even from fairly early on, uh, uh, when Grossman is talking about the Nazi concentration camps, uh, by the way, his mother died uh, when the Nazis swept into Ukraine. I think she was down in Ukraine somewhere. Anyway, she died in the Holocaust. Um, and so the novel actually, I think it may even open, or it's, it's very, it's near the very beginning of the novel where uh, we're in a, a concentration camp. And um, Grossman kind of speculates that uh, the Soviet system has uh, more in common in terms of this kind of totalitarian, authoritarian uh, form of government with Nazi Germany than it would care to admit. So as you can imagine, by drawing parallels like that, uh, it's a rather uh, direct criticism of, of the Soviet uh, government. And so it gives you some idea of why it was so sensitive politically. Um, but I always like to tell people, students that you know this novel was uh, kept under wraps for so long, uh, but uh, nowadays you can easily just buy it online in translation for like 20 bucks or whatever and uh, read something that in days past was such a, such a bombshell. Um, so by the way, if you, I mean, if you like historical novels, that's probably the number one novel uh, in terms of uh, 20th century, especially uh, World War II. Uh, history. Zizni Sujba. Okay, anyway, on that note, uh, until next time, do svidanya.